just about 12 years ago, say in the year 2009, 2010, what was India's renewable energy capacity? Maybe about 13 gigawatts of wind, zero of solar. And today, India has close to about 45 gigawatts of wind and 75 gigawatts of solar, which is a huge leap from practically nothing a dozen years ago. But the future appears to be even brighter for the Indian renewable energy sector. Against this backdrop, we will examine three discernible mega trends in the Indian renewable energy sector. When the Indian wind saga started about, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, we had tiny missions, missions that in today's context would be considered tiny. NEPC Micon started selling in India this 250 kilowatt missions and then they became 500 kilowatts and then we, we had 750 kilowatts. When the Spanish wind energy major Gamesa entered India around 2009-2010, they brought in an 800 kilowatt mission. Soon we had what was called the megawatt class missions, 1 megawatt, then 1.2 megawatt, 1.5 megawatt. GE was for a long time selling 1.6 megawatt missions. All that is passe. Today we are having, we are seeing monstrously huge missions. Missions of the kind that we used to see only for offshore earlier. To give an example, the Adani group in collaboration with the German company has brought in a 5.2 megawatt mission. The Chennai based Rajalakshmi group, more known for its educational institutions, Rajalakshmi Engineering and so on. They have entered wind turbine manufacture and they want to introduce a 4 megawatt mission with again German technology. The Chinese company Envision is selling 3.3 megawatt missions and they want to bring in bigger missions. Why are they bringing in bigger and bigger missions? Because basically bigger missions means we have larger, longer blades and longer blades sweep more area and can capture more wind which essentially means that these missions will be economically viable in regions where the wind speeds are not very high. This is really significant because it opens up new geographies for wind industry. Places where earlier you could not put up a wind project viably, you can today with these big missions. Solar again, the technology progress has been even more pronounced than perhaps in the wind industry. When we started solar, we were having these, uh, the famous polysilicon modules. Then polysilicon became monosilicon and monosilicon gave way to monoperc. Then we had monoperc bifacials and today we have monoperc bifacial n-type modules. Now what these things are, what these each one of these is, is not very relevant. The point to note is, with this technology improvements, we have seen an efficiency gain of about, say, anywhere between 3 and 4 percent. And then we have other areas where we are seeing technology improvements. For example, people are talking about motionless solar trackers. Earlier, we had trackers which keep the modules facing the sun as the sun moved across the firmament. Now, these trackers had obviously motors and several moving parts and they were expensive and they were also difficult to maintain, although there was a marked uh, gain in using these trackers. Uh, the adoption of trackers itself was not all that great. Now, people have begun talking about different technologies, motionless trackers using prisms. It's still not coming to the market, but it will come. And people are talking of things like agrophotovoltaic, which is a, an in thing today, which is basically you put up solar plants so high that you can do agriculture underneath it and we will do a separate video on agrophotovoltaic. The point I'm making is technological improvements is proving to be immensely helpful in the Indian renewable energy sector. That's the first mega trend that we are seeing. Now earlier we had all these secchi tenders calling for either wind or solar. That is, they would buy power from either a wind plant or a solar plant. Today, the in thing is round the clock supply of power, of green power or peak time supply of green power. 
and round the clock RTC is gaining momentum. And you can't do round the clock or peak time supply unless you have a little of both wind and solar and also storage. And the beauty is you don't have to necessarily have all of these in the same place. You can have wind in one state, solar in another, storage in another, you can still do this. It gives a tremendous amount of flexibility for developers to you know, participate in RTC tenders uh, and that's, that's picking up. Why this is happening is because the price of stored electricity itself is coming down. Earlier, when you stored green energy produced by either a solar farm or a wind plant, uh, in a, typically in a battery, it would cost about 14 rupees or 15 rupees a kilowatt hour. Today, it has come down below 7 rupees with a downward bias. It looks like it will come to below 5 rupees also, perhaps. To give an example, a recent tender of Rajasthan Urja Vikas Nigam asked for supply of renewable energy of 3 megawatt hours per megawatt of contracted capacity to be supplied between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. and between 6 p.m. and 10 p.m. The renewable energy company Blue Pine 100 megawatts quoting a tariff of 6 rupees 68 paise per kilowatt hour. Another renewable energy company Acme won 500 megawatts quoting a tariff of 6 rupees 69 paise per kilowatt hour. And now the government of India has come out with a viability gap funding scheme, a VGF scheme with the aim of bringing down the cost of stored electricity to somewhere around 5 rupees 50 paise per unit to about 6 rupees 60 paise per unit. That's the target. It is expected that about 4000 megawatt hours of storage capacity will be created because of this VGF. According to the renewable energy research and consultancy firm Mercom India, India has about 5020 megawatt hours of storage projects in the pipeline. Again, the point is stored electricity, stored green electricity prices are becoming affordable and experts say that you could be getting it for about 4 rupees, 4.5 rupees or 5 rupees which has huge ramifications for the Indian economy because if the prices of stored green electricity becomes cheaper than the prices of new coal plants, coal fired thermal power plants, who will buy power from coal plants? This really rings the death knell of coal-fired plants, which is good for the planet, which is good for India meeting its international emission reduction obligations. But it also brings in its wake a problem. Now, how do you deal with the existing coal sector? According to Global Energy Monitor, India has about 3,37,000 people working in coal mines. Now, we will have to find alternative livelihood for them. So, while this is good, it has its implications on the entire coal sector and the government will have to do something about that. But the good news is the prices of stored green electricity are coming down. That's the second mega trend. States that are already into renewable energy are increasing their ambitions and states that are not, that have not traditionally been big players in the renewable energy are getting into it. To give you an example, Gujarat has said it aims to have 36 gigawatts of solar and 143 gigawatts of wind. Rajasthan wants to have 65 gigawatts of wind, 15 gigawatts of solar and 10 gigawatts of pumped hydro storage. Other states that have not traditionally been big players in the renewable energy sector are now looking at it very seriously. A good example is that of Orissa, which is working towards ushering in the first 500 megawatts of wind. Now again, this ties back to the first point of technology advancements. Earlier, the state couldn't have done it. But with better missions today, Orissa is opening up to the wind sector. These three trends do not exist in isolation. Each has a bearing on the other. They are all interconnected. Together, they seem to assure a great future for the Indian renewable energy sector.